Ready. Yeah, I'm just showing her. And then the chair, I mean, behind her. The people who are back in the room.
Uh, line level. There's two of them on the wall. No, I'm sorry. Call you out. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> the embargo is lifted. We can tweet this out, everything. We expect to hear from the Deputy Attorney General who is telling us now is that this is an indictment against 12 Russian intelligence officials who are accused of hacking into the Democratic National Committee and the Clinton campaign, getting confidential information, and then releasing it with the intention of influencing the 2016 campaign. According to the indictment just filed here in federal court, these Russian intelligence officials used spear phishing techniques to get the uh, logon and password information from people working for the Democrats, and then leverage that information to get more out of the computers fully intending to make it public. It says that yes. they registered yeah. the name I'm of uh, 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 ECLeaks.com, which appeared in the summer of the campaign, and was widely thought to be the work of the Russian government. Well, now the indictment clearly says it was the work of Russian intelligence officials. And it also says they created the fictitious person, fictitious person known as Buchifer 2.0. This was uh, named for the, uh, the hacker who was actually charged with that. Uh, but it said he was a fictitious person who uh, released that information. It also says these Russians conspired to hack into the, I'm just looking to see if the deputies coming here, also conspired to hack into the computers of state election officials and the companies that make software for using, uh, that, that the state elections uh, boards use in order to maintain their voting. Now these are all 12 Russians. The prospect that they'll ever see uh, an American courtroom is very low. But this is a this is a practice that the Justice Department's been engaged in for the past couple of years to sort of name and shame uh, foreign officials. Of course, the fact that they've been indicted now makes it impossible for them to safely travel. They'll always be looking over their shoulders during the Interpol might arrest them if they cross a border into the West. But secondly, this is the heart of what Robert Mueller's investigation was supposed to look at, efforts to, to affect the American election. This is Russian meddling at its purest, you could say. Uh, the indictment argues that these are Russian government officials, Russian intelligence officials, uh, who were in charge of this hacking and in charge of releasing it, and that their intention all along was to affect the election.
beginning in June of 2016. The defendants falsely claimed that DC Leaks was a group of American hackers and that Guccifer 2.0 was a lone Romanian hacker. In fact, both were created and controlled by the Russian GRU. In addition to releasing documents directly to the public, the defendants transferred stolen documents to another organization that is not identified by name in the indictment, and they used that organization uh, as a pass-through to release the documents. To discuss the timing of the release in an attempt to enhance the impact on the election. In an effort to conceal their connections to Russia, the defendants used a network of computers around the world, and they paid for it using cryptocurrencies. The conspirators corresponded with several Americans during the course of the conspiracy through the internet. There's no allegation in this indictment that the Americans knew they were corresponding with Russian intelligence officers. In a second related conspiracy, Russian GRU officers hacked the website of a state election board and stole information about 500,000 voters. They also hacked into computers of a company that supplied software used to verify voter registration information. They targeted state and local officials responsible for administering elections, and they sent spear phishing emails to people involved in administering elections, including attaching malicious software. Now, the indictment includes 11 criminal allegations and a forfeiture allegation. Count one charges 11 defendants for conspiring to access computers without authorization and to damage those computers in connection with efforts to interfere with the presidential election. Counts two through nine charge those 11 defendants with aggravated identity theft by employing the usernames and passwords of victims in order to commit computer fraud. Count 10 charges those 11 defendants with money laundering for transferring cryptocurrencies through a web of transactions in order to purchase computer servers, register domains, and make other payments in furtherance of their hacking activities while trying to conceal their connections to Russia. Count 11 charges two defendants for a separate conspiracy to access computers without authorization and to damage those computers in connection with efforts to infiltrate computers used to administer elections. Finally, the indictment seeks the forfeiture of property involved in the criminal activity. There is no allegation in this indictment that any American citizen committed a crime. There's no allegation that the conspiracy changed the vote count or affected any election result. The special counsel's investigation is ongoing, and there will be no comments by the special counsel at this time. Assistant Attorney General John Demers is here with me today because we intend to transition the responsibility for this indictment to the Justice Department's National Security Division while we await the apprehension of the defendants. Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General Ed O'Callaghan is also with me and he's been assisting in managing the special counsel investigation. I want to caution you that people who speculate about federal investigations usually do not know all of the relevant facts. We do not try cases on television or in congressional hearings. Most anonymous leaks are not from the government officials who are actually conducting these investigations. We follow the rule of law, which means that we follow procedures and we reserve judgment. We complete our investigations, and we evaluate all of the relevant evidence before we reach any conclusion. That is how the American people expect their Department of Justice to operate, and that is how our department is going to operate. In our justice system, everyone who's charged with a crime is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. It should go without saying People who are not charged with a crime also are presumed innocent. The indictment was returned today because prosecutors determined that the evidence was sufficient to present these allegations to a federal grand jury. Our analysis is 
based solely on the facts, the law, and Department of Justice policies. I briefed President Trump about these allegations earlier this week. The President is fully aware of the Department's actions today. By my remarks, I have not identified the victims. We confront foreign interference in American elections. It's important for us to avoid thinking politically as Republicans or Democrats, and instead to think patriotically as Americans. Our response must not depend on which side is victimized. The internet allows foreign adversaries to attack America in new and unexpected ways. Free and fair elections are always hard fought and contentious. There will always be adversaries who seek to exacerbate our divisions and try to confuse, divide, and conquer us. So long as we are united in our commitment to the values enshrined in the Constitution, they will not succeed. Partisan warfare, fueled by modern technology, does not fairly reflect the grace, dignity, and unity of the American people. The blame for election interference belongs to the criminals who committed election interference. We need to work together to hold the perpetrators accountable. We need to keep moving forward to preserve our values, protect against future interference and defend America. <clears throat> I have time to take a few questions. General Williams, question for you, sir. Number one, the time of the day on the eve of the president's meeting with Putin, can you talk about that? And also, just today, the president described the Mueller investigation as a witch hunt. Your the response. timing, uh, as I mentioned, is a function of the collection of the facts, the evidence of the law, and the determination that was sufficient to present the indictment at this time. As I mentioned, I did brief the President. Uh, with regard to the nature of the investigation, I only comment on the evidence. The evidence that reflects is reflected in our indictments and in our charges represents a determination by prosecutors and agents without regard to politics that we believe the evidence is sufficient to justify the charges. Barry, uh, yes, Deputy Attorney General, I know you've talked about uh, the fact that, in your view, uh, the evidence doesn't show any votes were changed as a result of this hacking. But you did say that a, a company used as a pass-through coordinated with these defendants to enhance the timing of the release and the impact on the election. Can you talk a little bit about what the evidence you have shows in that respect? So what I've talked about today is what is led to the indictment. Uh, we know that according to the allegations of the indictment, the goal of the conspirators was to have an impact on the election. What impact they may have had, or what their uh, motivation may have been independently of what's required to prove this offense, is a matter of speculation. That's not our responsibility. What I've said is there's no allegation in the indictment about it, uh, and that's not our turn. In terms of the state election information, you said about 500,000 voters. <clears throat> information was collected. Is there any evidence that what, what the Russians did with that information? And is there any evidence of other states being successfully penetrated by the Russians? I think that uh, it's important for you to understand what I've told you are the allegations that are included in the indictment. The FBI and other intelligence community agencies are working constantly to defend against cyber attacks in the United States. This case is just about one particular uh, effort that uh, was made during the 2016 election. The efforts of our department, of the Department of Homeland Security, and other federal agencies, and of all uh, of the state election boards throughout the country are ongoing. Uh, and those efforts uh, preceded this indictment, and they're going to post-date this indictment. So we have continued to share any relevant intelligence with all of our partners. Uh, it take a longer time to talk about this, but there is a concerted and organized effort by the federal government to make sure that we do deter and prevent any sort of cyber attacks on our elections and that we harden our election systems to prevent against any kind of intrusions. We'll take the last question for Yeah, Deputy Attorney General, you mentioned that you briefed President Trump on this earlier this week. Did he indicate any his support for this action and what was his reaction? I'm allowed the President to speak for himself. Uh, obviously, it was important for the President to know uh, what information we've uncovered because he's got to make very important decisions for the country. So he needs to understand what evidence we have 
foreign election interference. Thank you very much. <laughs> you were hoping to... Who ordered the attack? Intelligence and National Security reporter Matt Miller, former chief spokesman for the Justice Department and MSNBC Justice and Security Analyst, former FBI Special Agent Clint Watts, an MSNBC National Security Analyst, and with me here on set, Nick Burns, former U.S. Ambassador to NATO during the George W. Bush administration, and Michael Carpenter, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. Pete Williams now joins me from the press conference. Pete, what is your takeaway? connection of the Mueller investigation. There have been other charges like that. Uh, no, the, the Russians are not going to cooperate in, in arresting them. Rod Rosenstein, he said he looks forward to their apprehension. That's not likely to happen. But by filing these charges, it makes it very, very difficult for these uh, folks to ever, these 12 people, to ever travel outside of Russia uh, or a, a country that doesn't cooperate with, uh, with Interpol, because if they do, they'll be arrested. Uh, there'll be red notices put out on them, and it limits their travel. To some extent, it may also limit the ability of them to access any funds that they have outside of Russia or any funds that are in the West. Uh, one of the interesting things I thought in the news conference, Lester, was the Deputy Attorney General saying this information was passed through to uh, an American or to, an, to another entity, which he declined to name. I guess the big question is whether that was WikiLeaks. That's certainly been the supposition. And then finally, Lester, I would also say that uh, the Deputy spent a lot of time not looking at his notes, talking about the need for bipartisanship. Uh, he's certainly been on the receiving end of some pretty harsh criticism from Congress. And then yesterday you had the spectacle of that hearing with the former FBI agent Peter Strzok before the House did, uh, before the House that went on for hours during the day. And he's uh, obviously trying to be above all that and, and saying in essence to his congressional critics, come on, let's get on the same team. It's not you versus us, it's the U.S trying to defend itself from this overseas attack on the election, Lester. And that's Pete Williams talking to Lester Holt on the NBC News special report. Uh, joining me now, uh, Ken Delaney, and back in our newsroom. Let's talk about the importance of this indictment. No Americans named. These are Russians. They're out of reach, clearly, of American apprehension, unless they travel outside of Russia, with which we have no extradition treaty. But the significance is that they are drawing a line, and what Rod Rosenstein says is that he briefed the president. We saw him at the White House earlier this week, and there was a lot of speculation. What was he doing there? And now we know he was briefing the president that these Russians are going to be indicted. It's going to be announced. And the president clearly knew of the timing likely happening while he's on this trip before the summit with Vladimir Putin. That's right, Andrea. And I find the timing to be the most significant thing about this, because I'm looking through this indictment. We're not actually learning very much from these charges that, that we didn't already know. Because after all, there's been a detailed intelligence assessment published. There's been a lot of reporting. Uh, we have the names of these Russians in the indictment, which we didn't have before. But, you know, we knew the broad strokes of this story, how the Russian intelligence agency hacked the Democrats and hacked John Podesta, Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, and disseminated the information first through these fake sites, Guccifer and DC Leaks, and then through WikiLeaks. And, and actually, NBC News reported several months ago that this indictment was going to happen, that eventually Robert Mueller would issue an indictment explaining how the Russian government did this and potentially naming Russian government officials. But what, what's amazing to me is doing this on the eve of a summit where Donald Trump is going to sit down with Vladimir Putin. Um, and yes, uh, the president was brief, but what's not clear is is did he have any choice in the matter? Would, would, if he had said, look, Rod, I'd rather that you do this after the summit, uh, would, would Rosenstein and Mueller have delayed this announcement? Why now? That's an interesting unanswered question. I also, I also think it is deeply significant that um, the Justice Department and Mueller have taken this step of naming Russian intelligence officials in an indictment. That's a dangerous game. American intelligence officials also hack Russians or, and Chinese uh, citizens and others around the world. Um, and it's a rare step when the United States government calls out officials of another intelligence agency. We've done it a few times with Iran and China when we feel like a certain line has been crossed. And I think that's the message here. This is not fair game. 
to actually hack into um, an election and, and interfere with the democratic process in the United States. We don't consider that a fair use of intelligence resources. We wouldn't do that to them, I think American officials would say. Uh, it's one thing to gather information. It's another thing to deploy it and weaponize it, as was done here. Another thing I'll say is that Rod Rosenstein said it's a matter of speculation what the Russians wanted to do in terms of the outcome of the election. I would take issue with that. It's not a matter of speculation. The U.S. intelligence community has said very definitively that their intent was to hurt Hillary Clinton and help Donald Trump. Uh, Pete Williams, our colleague, now reporting again from the news conference. Pete, there are no Americans named in this. That's the other piece of it. We've all been waiting to see whether Robert Mueller can connect the That's Russian right, hacking to any American operatives helping them to weaponize it because the the Russian emails that were the hacks from the DNC were really targeted. Uh, I can think of a number of instances where I would be traveling with the campaign covering Hillary Clinton and a particular email by one of, of the millions that were really taken from 10 years, for instance, of, of John Podesta's emails would be put out there at a particular moment in that campaign for maximum damage to Hillary Clinton. So no Americans helping the Russians so far. Not wittingly. I think that's the main point that uh, the deputy attorney general was making here. He was saying that some of these Russian folks were in touch with Americans, but he says the, uh, there's no indication that the Americans knew that they were dealing with Russian intelligence officials. So they may well have been aware the, the Americans who were uh, who were caught up in this may well have been aware that they had uh, material that was hacked from Democratic computers. But according to the Justice Department, these Americans who were unnamed had no idea what the source of the information was, who it was who stole it. Uh, so that's a significant point, Andrea, here. This is, this is, an, this is a, an indictment that looks in one direction only. It looks at what the Russians did in the U.S. It doesn't look the other direction. It's not focused on whether Americans helped them. Uh, and to the extent that uh, that happened, it was after the material was obtained. And so this is all about how it was initially stolen using these time-tested techniques that seem to keep constantly working, known as spear phishing, where you send out an email that looks like something innocent, you click on it, and it ends up uh, either stealing your login and password information or implanting uh, software in the computer that allows them then basically to remotely access what's on the computer, to look at the screen, to monitor keystrokes, and to download information. So it's a pretty blunt instrument that they use and once they used it, then they were quite crafty, the indictment says, about how they peddled it, trying to make it look like it was coming from American entities when, in fact, the Russians were behind it all the way. And is it fair to infer, or accurate, I should say, to infer that this is it, or the investigation continues, so this does not mean definitively that there was never any collusion, or will the president be able to say, well, nobody in my campaign cooperated with this? Well, I think it's too soon to tell that. Uh, this is this this is the second shoe that we've been expected to drop here in terms of how this information was hacked. Remember, the indictment that came out in February was about sort of self-initiated efforts by Russian operatives to falsely create information and plant it on social media. So the, always the focus has been on who stole this information from the Democrats. So we've been expecting the second shoe to drop. And I think, Andrea, it, it has to be pointed out here, this is an amazing bit of detective work to actually, as they, as they say uh, in this intelligence world, to attribute these attack not only to a country, not only to a part of that country, but to actual individuals, which suggests that the FBI and the other intelligence agencies have really developed up to amazing tools to figure out where these attacks are coming from, the actual computers that were, that were used and who was sitting at them. It's, it's an astonishing bit of detective work. And with us now, Pete, as well as Nick Burns, former NATO ambassador, of course, Russia expert from the NSC, the State Department. Uh, Nick, is this going to increase pressure on the president to cancel a very controversial summit with Vladimir Putin on Monday? Or he, can he say, well, this gives me an opportunity to ask him about it? It's going to have a direct and major impact on that meeting in Helsinki. If you think about the primary responsibility of the President of the United States, defend the country. 
defend the country from foreign attack. This is an extraordinary grand jury indictment alleging a criminal conspiracy by the Russian military to undermine our elections. They're very specific. Into the computer system of the Democratic National Committee, of the Hillary Clinton campaign, of the volunteers for the Hillary Clinton campaign, and of state election officials. If the president goes to this meeting, this has to be number one issue, and he has to be tough about it. I doubt he's going to do that, given his remarks in London this morning, but that's what he owes us. Only this morning he called it a witch hunt. Eric Swalwell is a Democratic congressman, of course, and a member of the House Intelligence and Judiciary Committees who was at that uh, very controversial hearing yesterday. Congressman, we also heard Rod Rosenstein cautioning everyone not to presume where the Mueller investigation is going, not to speculate, and saying that they follow the rule of law, the rule of evidence, and that partisan politics does not play a role in Justice Department decisions. It's hard for a lot of Americans after what they witnessed yesterday with the Republican majority uh, trying to control that joint hearing and the way Peter Strzok, an FBI agent, was being treated as a witness and, and uh, threatened, really, from the chair. It's hard for Americans to really have confidence in the system. Yeah, that's right, Andrea. And yesterday was an opportunity for us to use unity as an antidote against what the Russians have done uh, to find ways to protect the ballot box. But it's not too late. I hope this is a wake-up call for my Republican colleagues. We have the strongest evidence at the highest standards of proof that show that the Russians attacked us, they hacked, they stole, they disrupted. And the best thing we can do is to make sure they don't do that again in this upcoming election. I wrote legislation to have an independent commission. I wrote that back in December of 2016. We can still bring that forward, put our best elders and statesmen on this task so we can make sure that we're better protected, as Mr. Rosenstein called for, as we go to the ballot box this November. And what do you want to see now in terms of protection of the Mueller probe of Rod Rosenstein uh, amidst all this pressure, including the president today calling it a witch hunt after he had been briefed earlier this week, we now learn, by Rod Rosenstein that 12 individual GRU members, Russian intelligence yeah. operatives, were going to be named and indicted today. Well, first, let Mueller finish. That's the most important thing we can do. The president, throughout this hacking, has called it a witch hunt. On July 25, 2016, he said there's no way that the Russians were responsible. We see now uh, today that they are responsible. But Andrea, if the president wants this investigation to end, he should answer the questions that Bob Mueller has for him. Peter Strzok, James Comey, they raised their right hands. They went under oath for hours and answered questions. If he sits in that chair, I promise you, this investigation will reach its conclusion much sooner. Should the president cancel the meeting with Vladimir Putin? And if he doesn't, what should he say to Vladimir Putin on Monday in Helsinki? If President Trump is unwilling to confront Vladimir Putin about this strong piece of evidence, he should cancel the meeting. He should tell Putin it's unacceptable to do this. There's going to be more penalties if he continues to do it. And make sure that President Trump can report to the American people that he made that confrontation and attribution to Vladimir Putin. If he doesn't do that, it makes us and our president look weak. Congressman, thank you very much um, for joining us now, as well as Michael Carpenter, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia, now a senior director at the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement. Uh, Michael, th what we're learning from this indictment is that on June 27th, excuse me, July 27th, the day that uh, President Trump I'm sorry, we're going we're gonna to get this straight. On June 27th, 2016, the day when uh, President then candidate Trump said, Russia, if you're listening, you know, go after those Hillary Clinton emails. Where are those other emails? The e emails that they claimed at the time were missing from her private server, uh, which did not prove to be the case. On that very day, these Russian operatives started spear phishing. So there's Absolutely. a direct connection to what the president as a candidate was saying publicly. This is a spectacular bit of cyber forensics that we're learning about right now. And there's a couple important things here to remember. What we are seeing from this set of indictments is we are tying both the hacking and doxing campaign of the DNC and the DCCC to the intrusions by Russian military intelligence into state election boards and into that private company that did voter registration efforts, which, by the way, is a potential avenue for influencing an election via voter suppression. If you can 
mess with the voter registration rolls, you can affect outcome on election day. And so we see that. We also know, by the way, that this GRU, Russian military intelligence persona, was talking to Americans, Roger Stone and, um, and a Florida GOP operative. So this sets the predicate then for being able to investigate exactly what the Russians were after in terms of Americans, who they were talking to, why they were talking to them, what they were trying to get from them. Uh, and so I think this is just the first shoe. And I just want to clarify, it was a, a, exactly a month later, July 27th, when the, the president said what he said about Russia, if you're listening, and they already were doing their fishing operations. But clearly, there was a nexus between what was happening that summer and uh, the comments of the president. Nick, this is a critical moment. He comes out of NATO. He's criticized Theresa May, he, who is politically vulnerable, given what's happened with Brexit and, and the resignation of her foreign minister, her foreign secretary, and he praises Boris Johnson, that foreign secretary, and a rival of Theresa May's, and says that he would make a good prime minister. When have we last seen an American president interfere in a British election or any overseas election of an ally? We have not seen this kind of wrecking ball tour of Europe by any American president in the history of our country to go after the Germans, to go after the British, to go after NATO and the EU. And now the White House has a big problem with optics. They've had this disputatious tour of Europe, our best allies. The president's going to see Putin if he doesn't cancel the meeting. He does, it, this cannot look like an embrace of Putin. It can't look like two buddies getting together. Our president needs to be tough on this issue of interference, on Crimea, on the nerve agent attack, which cost a British woman her life last week. The president indicated at the press conference this morning at Chequers he's not prepared to do that. He wants to have a nice meeting with Putin. How can he do that following these indictments? Former FBI Special Agent Clint Walks, an MSNBC national security analyst, joining us as well. Clint, the forensics here are pretty remarkable, as Pete has mentioned, Michael Carpenter, Nick Burns. As a former FBI official, Tell us how hard this is to have tracked these specific 12, according to the allegations in the indictment. Yeah, this is a multi-agency, probably multi-year effort to try and track down these forensics. And we've heard conspiracies in the meantime. This is hard to prove. And you've seen it both from Russia and from even uh, congressmen at times, that there is no proof of this direct connection between Russia and the DNC breach and other hacks that went on. This is a very substantial document with lots of details, comparable to the Internet Research Agency indictment that we saw back in February. And it puts names on personas. The other key thing that this indictment does is it links hacking and influence. This was always kind of a, something that was elusive whenever you would go hear Putin say, oh, it was patriotic Russians that were involved. This is very clearly Russian GRU intelligence officers that were undertaking actions at the behest of the Russian government, and they were using those to influence the campaign. This is where social media and hacking have come together for this influence, and this is where that indictment fits really well with that February one, which was also of great detail. It, shoot down, it shoots down alternative theories about the DNC breach. If you remember the conspiracies about Seth Rich, maybe this came from alternative locations. And it pushes back on media personalities that have levered these conspiracies as well. So I think it's important to note that Putin has consistently used the answer, it was not us, you have no proof of it, show us. Well, this is an indictment and there's a whole lot of proof in here. And so when we look to Monday, whenever President Trump is going in with President Putin, he cannot accept that answer anymore, that it was patriotic Russians. It was very clearly Putin's Russians that were doing this business. Matt Miller, you're a former chief spokesman for the Justice Department. As Clint has just pointed out, this is hard evidence alleged. Does this in any way insulate Robert Mueller and Rod Rosenstein from the attacks, or are those attacks in such a political arena that uh, they will be, that this indictment will also be disputed? Uh, it certainly helps. I mean, I, I think they can't be unaware of the attacks that have been uh, occurring against them. They can't be unaware of the damage it's done uh, to Robert Mueller's reputation, not with, you know, member, the broad mainstream public. But if you look at the polls and look at how Republicans have, have changed in their opinions of, of him over time, uh, it, it, the, the attacks that the president and, and, his, and his counsel, Rudy Giuliani, have launched against Mueller have taken their toll. Uh, the best way to answer those attacks, because Bob Mueller can't go out and do interviews, can't go out and defend himself, is to respond in court with facts. And today he put a lot of new facts on the record that show very convincingly this isn't a witch hunt. This is a serious investigation and it's producing fruit. 
And you know, we, 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 you have to ask about the timing of this. I mean, obviously, you know, we've talked about this. Ken, Ken I think, raised the important question of whether the president, uh, when he was briefed earlier in this week, would have objected to the timing, whether the Department of Justice would have coordinated with the, the, the timing with the president. It is such a hard question to answer because in a typical investigation, you know, we've, we've talked for, for months about how the Justice Department and the White House don't coordinate on criminal investigations. There's a big exception to that, and that's national security investigations. And with a typical president who is defending the country and who is responding to an attack on the country by trying to hold those responsible for the attack accountable, you might coordinate with the White House the announce of this indictment so the president could go into this meeting with a new piece of ammunition in, in his pocket, that he could go in and say, you know, hold this indictment up to Vladimir Putin and say, look, this is the hard evidence that you attacked our elections. Of course, I don't think anyone thinks that Donald Trump's going to do that in a meaningful way. And so I have to question whether the timing of this indictment was both for a way for the special counsel and for Rod Rosenstein to push back against the really inappropriate attacks, and also if it was a little bit of a way to force the president's hand as he goes into this meeting on Monday. And joining us by phone now is John Brennan, an MSNBC national security, senior national security and intelligence analyst and, of course, former CIA director. John, in looking through this indictment and these operatives, these GRU members, tell us the significance of naming 12 members of the GRU and how this connects it to the Kremlin. Well, I think uh, this is the next step in uh, Robert Mueller's uh, investigative uh, efforts in terms of first the uh, Internet Research Agency and the private Russian citizens, but now the actual perpetrators of this attack, uh, Russian intelligence officials from GRU. Uh, and uh, in order for there to be any type of conspiracy indictment that might be levied against any U.S. persons, you need to have that indictment uh, involving a U.S. Uh, Russian intelligence officials, because you cannot conspire with just a foreign citizen, you need to conspire with a foreign government. So, as I actually said, the indictment does not uh, say that any uh, U.S. person was cooperating with them willingly, but that doesn't mean that there's not future indictments that may be coming down that will indicate that there was some type of cooperation uh, or active collusion uh, with uh, Russian officials. And I think the timing of this was appropriate, given that Mr. Trump had announced previously that he was going to meet with Vladimir Putin. And so it was right for the Department of Justice to let Mr. Trump know that statements were coming down to give him the opportunity to decide to call off the meeting with Mr. Putin or, as was just said, to use it as further ammunition against Mr. Putin that the Russians clearly were involved in trying to interfere in our election. Now, Mr. Trump has demonstrated, I think, so far that he does not take a lot of this information from the Department of Justice and the special counsel very seriously. But I do think it was critically important for the Department of Justice to forward this now, and uh, so that it's not going to be on the eve of the midterm elections. But there's still, you know, a fair amount of time between now and the beginning of September. So there could be other actions that the Department of Justice may decide to move forward with. John Brennan making some key points about the timing of this as well, as well as the substance. And on that point, to that point, Chuck Rosenberg is a former FBI official and, and, and NBC and MSNBC contributor. Let's talk about what the president said today, even today, not softening his criticism, not backing down from the witch hunt allegations about this investigation. So he'd already been briefed by Rod Rosenstein. If he was going to take this in and arm himself with it, to prepare for the Putin meeting, it doesn't seem so far, at least, that he has. No, that's right, Andrea. Look, if this is a witch hunt, it's a remarkably successful one. It seems like there are 12 more witches that we now know about. Um, the, one of the key things that Rod Rosenstein said today is that this investigation is ongoing. That was his word, not mine. Uh, that shouldn't surprise us. What we continue to see time after time uh, is Bob Mueller and the FBI agents and prosecutors working with him, uh, acting in an extraordinarily professional manner, quietly, diligently, and methodically uh, uncovering facts and bringing cases cases uh, when those facts dictate. The, another shoe has dropped today. There are more to drop, I can almost assure you. I don't believe that is rank speculation. Uh, this indictment itself makes reference to U.S. persons who were in contact with the Russians. Uh, it doesn't name those persons. It doesn't say that the U.S. persons did anything wrong. But there is clearly more facts that are going to be uh, laid at our doorstep in the months and maybe even years to come.
There's even a, a reference on one page of this indictment to a, a congressional candidate um, being contacted by Guccifer, perhaps unwittingly not knowing that Guccifer was posing and was actually Russian intelligence. So a congressional candidate looking for a Democratic DNC or DCCC Democratic Campaign Committee information on that candidate's opponent. That's right. And so, uh, again, no allegation that this candidate or these persons knew that they were dealing with Russian intelligence. But flip that around, Andrea. It's very clear that Russian intelligence knew precisely with whom they were dealing. Uh, this was not random. This was not all political campaign committees. This was the Democratic Congressional Cam Campaign Committee and the DNC. They were very clear in who they were targeting and what they were going to do with the stuff that they stole from these campaign committees. They were going to publish them. Uh, and so uh, whatever the president wishes to call this, uh, putting that aside for a moment, this is a, uh, a very thoughtful, clear, precise, uh, federal criminal investigation, uh, and uh, great credit is due to the FBI who worked on this. And the reason I say that, despite the withering criticism of the FBI by the president and others, they continue to do their jobs. We should be very grateful for that. Well, certainly it was a very difficult day for the FBI yesterday, Ken Delaney, and we saw nine hours and 41 minutes of that hearing where the FBI was really on trial as Peter Strzok, an FBI agent, was being pilloried by the combined committees. Absolutely, Andrea. And I think um, a large portion of Rod Rosenstein's statement today appeared to be a, somewhat of a response to that, where he said, look, I'm not even mentioning the party of the people who were hacked in my remarks. It's mentioned in the indictment, obviously, because I want us to think of this as not a Democrat or Republican issue, but a patriotic issue. And he defended the integrity of the FBI and the Justice Department and said, we follow the facts where they lead. And that came, as you said, after a day when Republican members of Congress spent hours pillorying this FBI agent, who certainly made some mistakes, but trying to suggest that he was his bias tainted not only the Hillary Clinton email investigation, but the Russia investigation. And Andrea, I just want to go back to something you mentioned a while ago. I just find this absolutely remarkable. There was a time um, in, on July 27, 2016, during the presidential campaign, when Donald Trump, in a news conference, made a remarkable statement. He said, Russia, if you're listening, you know, please try to find the 30,000 missing Hillary Clinton emails. That was a reference to emails that Clinton had deleted and were seen to be irretrievable. There is a passage in this indictment on page 7 that says that on that very day, the Russian conspirators attempted after hours to spearfish for the first time <laughs> email accounts uh, used by Clinton's personal office. And it says, it continues, the, the indictment continues, at or around the same time, they also targeted 76 email addresses at the domain for the Clinton campaign. And, and it, one, this is only speculation, but that date is mentioned specifically in this indictment. Um, and one can imagine that's not a coincidence. Uh, the President of the United States made an instruction to the Russians, and apparently these hackers were listening and followed through. Um, a reasonable person may assume. And, and obviously, whether he intended to do that, whether that was just rhetoric, campaign rhetoric, you would think that he would have something to say about that. There is a nexus between his comments, apparently, and actions by these Russian hackers going after Clinton emails. I just find that remarkable, Andrea. Well, let me bring in our White House correspondent, Jeff Bennett, in London. Uh, Jeff, you're there in London where thousands and thousands of British uh, people are protesting against this president on a lot of issues. And now the timing of this, just as the president is going into Windsor Castle for tea with the Queen of England, he, this indictment it's is announced. Remarkable, uh, clearly Andrea. he had some, some notice of this. You can see the still fit picture that has been released to the American traveling pool reporters of Melania Trump, Donald Trump smiling, and the Queen uh, with a sort of an impassive expression on her face. She has done these kinds of moments uh, thousands and thousands of times over the, her long reign. Uh, this is clearly one of the most awkward in terms of the timing, though, Jeff. 
Oh, that's certainly the case. And as I, as I speak to you from London, I can hear two helicopters hovering above uh, those helicopters, keeping a close eye on the protesters uh, below. But as you mentioned, that's right, the president is wrapping up his trip here to the U.K., ending it with this meeting with the queen. From here, he heads to, heads to his ancestral home of Scotland. He's going to spend the weekend there at his private golf club and then head right into this summit, this meeting, this long-planned meeting uh, with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Now, we have reached out to the White House through official channels to find out if these the news of these indictments will change uh, the scope of the meeting in any way. If it's still going to happen, we haven't heard yet uh, from the White House. We've also reached out to the Treasury Department to get a sense of whether there might be any new sanctions coming in light of the indictments. No word there. Also, still no word from the president's team of lawyers. But uh, this is fairly remarkable stuff. This news coming just uh, as the president would certainly like to leave this trip with a, with a very different message, uh, but certainly also leaving a trail of chaos uh, behind him from the contentious NATO summit, also to the really stunning incendiary interview he gave to The Sun, although he tried to do damage control and cleanup on both counts, Andrea. And Jeff, uh, with me here, Michael Carpenter, a former defense official, and of course, Nick Burns, a former ambassador to NATO, both of you with long experience in government. Uh, Michael, what does the president do? Vladimir Putin obviously has a wish list. The wish list is not just the handshake. That is not as important to him as in a, a parallel summit that we had in Singapore with Kim Jong-un. What he wants is some specifics on perhaps Baltic exercises. The president has hinted at that, on Crimea, on sanctions, on normalizing relations, and more pushback against NATO. He's already received that as a, a big pre-benefit. Yeah, President Putin wants essentially for this summit to result in a statement that the United States and Russia have a robust list of areas of cooperation where we're going to work together and uh, come out of this thinking that our relationship is now entering a new detente and we're just going to move forward uh, with a potentially an agreement in Ukraine, in Syria, so on and so forth. Now, President Trump has said he's going to go into this and he's going to challenge him on election interference, but he said, but Putin's going to deny it, so there's really nothing I can do. Well, that conversation just got a whole lot more interesting as a result of this invite indictment. So if if Putin is going to deny it, we now have the proof of the specific individuals in the military intelligence unit in Moscow who carried out these series of hacks. And so how is Trump going to frame that? That's a very important conversation going into the summit. And joining us as well is Joyce Vance, a former U.S. prosecutor. Uh, Joyce, how tough is this indictment? Uh, in terms of a major step for the Mueller team. They're certainly going back to the, the, the well on the Russia end of it. We've yet to see any evidence alleged so far about the American piece of it. Well, this is like another giant footprint landing in the sand for the Mueller investigation. We saw the Russian troll farm investigation earlier this year, which talked about social media manipulation. Now Mueller is coming forward with evidence that indicates that Russian intelligence officers were responsible for hacking American political entities and using the information that they obtained to try to influence the United States presidential election. So I think we're seeing a slow march forward. We've not seen Americans uh, indicted yet, but Rod Rosenstein tells us that the investigation is ongoing. And as so many commentators have pointed out, there's a lot of information available to us. Mueller undoubtedly has far more, and I think we will inevitably see additional indictments that link up the American participation in this process. And Nick, this does put more pressure.